also love the world.
not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here for what? He has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he lay. And so that's why we're here today, is to look on our risen Savior, to behold the empty tomb, and to claim all that means for us in the promises that Jesus has accomplished for us. And so we join with the church all around the world, and over the course of millennia, even the church that's gathered in heaven together, saying these words that the church has been saying for a very long time, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And so let's give you praise and worship in this place. Join our voices together. Here we go. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are up.
Well, welcome to Chapel Hill. We're so glad that you are celebrating this Easter Sunday with us. My name is Ellis White. And I'm Rachel White. And we are two of the pastors here at the church. We exist to exalt Jesus, elevate others, and launch disciple makers. And if you want to find anything more about our church, you can do that through something we call the guide. You can scan that QR code on the screen or in the pews in front of you. Go to chapelhillpc.org slash guide. In fact, if you're new, there's an I'm new button on there. You can hit that and get connected with us and we can help you find out more about the church. And a couple of our pastors are going to be back at the wood wall in the lobby after the service. If you want to ask anything at all about the church, head back there following the service and ask your questions of them. We got any kids in the house? Any kids you want to wave to me this morning? Happy Easter to you kids. We're so glad you're joining us in big church for Easter Sunday. Ordinarily, our kids would be down the other end of the building in kids worship. And actually, we, we have our kids team here in the lobby too. If you have any questions about what happens at kids worship on a normal Sunday, go chat to them. They'd love to let you know and welcome you back to a future Sunday here at Chapel Hill. And I want to let you know about something we're really excited about that's coming up in the life of the church. It's called Alpha. If you would describe yourself as skeptical or spiritual or not religious or a Christian that has big questions, Alpha might be something for you to consider. And we'd love to invite you to participate in that. We have a Zoom call coming up this Wednesday night to find out more. It's called Discover Alpha. It starts at 7 o'clock. It's just 30 minutes and you will not need to put on your camera or speak. If you have any questions, you can type those in the chat, but I would love to get to share that more with you, so please do join on Wednesday. We're really excited for it to start at the end of the month. April 24th is our first evening, and if you want to find out more about any of these things or register for that Zoom call, you can do that in the guide or find out more at gigharboralpha.com. I'm super excited. I hope you will join me, but I don't want you to just take my word for it. Please take a look at this video to find out about views from some previous participants. The reason I'm at Alpha is because I had friends at the YMCA who said, you should come to this because you'll meet a bunch of nice people. And I said to them, I mean, it's okay if I come, but you have to understand, I'm agnostic. Well, I went to a few meetings over at Chapel Hill, and they are the nicest people. And I have such a good time being with them, and I kind of like taking the counterpoint with them, which I do at every meeting and we still all get along. I was pleasantly surprised on how it was very graceful, it wasn't heavy handed, and it led you deeper and deeper in each session. Anybody who has any questions, they're open, welcome, and they're very receptive to any question you might have. I encourage everybody to give it a try, old, young, new, Christian, non-Christian. I've enjoyed the uh, kinship that I've made at my table uh, with perfect strangers. I have made some great friends with the new people that are, are in my life and uh, they're going to stay in my life because we want to continue to stay in touch with each other. Yeah, you don't have to be like a religious person to be an alpha. You can be an atheist. You can be an agnostic. You can be a true believer. All of them can come to Alpha. Remember that. I love those thumbs up at the end. We give two thumbs up for Alpha here at Chapel Hill, and we do hope that you will join us at Alpha. You can find out more about it in the guide. I encourage you, if you have questions about it, to attend that Zoom this week, or you can come by the wood wall, and we would love to answer your questions. Now, as we turn to our, our hearts to a time of giving, 2 Corinthians says that whatever you give is acceptable as long as you give it eagerly and give out of what you have, not out of what you don't have. Whether you have $2 or $2 billion, whether you give $2 or you give $2 billion, God doesn't care. What he cares about is the eagerness of your heart, the way in which you give. And so we want to thank you for giving, whether you're giving $2 or whether you're giving $2 billion. Thank you for being a part of the work that God has called us to at Chapel Hill. We are so grateful for you. I want to tell you about a couple of things that your giving goes to. When, you're, when you give at Chapel Hill, you are giving to the work that God has called this church to, and you are a part of this church. You are part of that work. You are helping plant churches 
in our community and across the country. You are helping to support local outreach partners like the Coffee Oasis and Fish Food Bank and Tacoma Rescue Mission. You are helping take the gospel to the ends of the earth through ministries in Mexico and Haiti and Thailand. So thank you for giving. And there are a number of ways that you can give. You can find out more about that at chapelhillpc.org forward slash give. We're going to take our offering in just a moment by passing plates here in our service. If you are giving for the first time, I want to give you a special thank you. Thank you so much for taking that step of faith. We take our offering during our worship services because we do believe that it is an act of worship. And we know that every time you give, you're saying, Lord, I trust in you. I trust that you will be faithful and you will provide. And if you are giving for the first time, we know that that's a big first step. So thank you for giving. Now, would you turn your hearts with me as we dedicate our offering? And we'll close our time in prayer by praying the Lord's Prayer together. It will be up on the screen if you're unfamiliar with the words. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we do rejoice with the entire world today, celebrating that Christ our Lord has risen. I think of all of those things that I mentioned, from the church plant at Kitsap House, which just finished up their worship service this morning, to our global outreach partners in Mexico, in Thailand, all around the world. These partners are proclaiming that truth, that you are risen. And we thank you, Lord, that in some small way, in some part, our faithfulness in giving is part of proclaiming that truth to the world. We pray that you would multiply it. We pray that more people would come to know the good news of Christ risen through the work of this church. Thank you, Lord, that you called us into this work together. We thank you for the gathered body of Christ at Chapel Hill. We thank you for the opportunity to join our voices together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And we thank you for the prayer and the praise that we get to join in. And we join together now praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
song was awesome. <laughs> that was great, Miriam. Good job, team. Well, welcome to Easter, everybody. Good to have you here. You could have gone nowhere. You could have gone somewhere else, but you came here to be a... What, did I knock a bunch of flowers down? I'm sorry. I'm making a mess. We're really glad you're here this morning. In fact, it's kind of a grand family reunion every year at this time, and I'm going to take a point of personal privilege to to celebrate a piece of family news. One of the daughters of our church, Brenna Maxwell, played on this year's Gonzaga uh, women's basketball team. She was one of the leading scorers in the nation, and as you probably know, Gonzaga made it to the Sweet 16. That is very impressive, and I think it's worth celebrating. Good job, Brenna and team. So, in our yard, Cindy and I have a retaining wall that's made of rocks. A few weeks ago, I uh, came home to discover that the wall had collapsed. The rain had soaked the soil behind. We don't have proper draining, apparently. Uh, Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it was a supreme hassle. I had rocks all over my driveway. And I was going to rebuild this myself. I'm a little disappointed in your response to that. But I thought better of it. And so I called my friend and neighbor, Todd Davis, who is our awesome interim high school director. I called called Todd. Now, Todd is only slightly younger than me, but we both consider ourselves pretty fit. So we pulled out our steel pry bars and our shovels and our gloves, and we went to work. And I'm telling you, we were sucking wind by the time we were done with that project. Those rocks may not look very impressive, but they were heavy. But as you can see, we got it rebuilt. I even pulled back the vines so that it would look natural. It looks beautiful, I think you would agree. It only cost us a few years off of our life. And in Todd's case, a smashed pinky finger. (laughs) Yep, that one hurt. But I'm so grateful for his help. I could not have moved those stones alone. This morning we come to the greatest story ever told. It is the story of a faithful woman named Mary who returned to the tomb of her friend and rabbi to honor him with a proper burial. But as she was making her way to the tomb, it crossed her mind, how in the world am I going to remove that stone that is blocking the door of the tomb? How will I get it out of there? But it turns out, She didn't need to have to worry. The stone had already been moved. And who did it that favor for her? Well, I'm not going to give away the punchline, but I'll just say this. It rhymes with Todd. So turn to John chapter 20, and we'll read about what the Lord did that day. John chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that was John, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet... They did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Then the disciples went back to their homes. This is the word of the Lord. There are four books that tell the story of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're called Gospels. They're the first four 
uh, books in the New Testament, and every one of them agrees on the same thing about the resurrection. Mary Magdalene was the first witness to the empty tomb of Jesus. And we're so used to that, we know that, we've known it all of our Sunday school lives probably, that we don't realize what a really remarkable thing it was that she would be remembered in that way in an ancient piece of Scripture. Because at that time, women were nobodies in the culture. And they didn't, even, they didn't even allow women to give testimony in a court. So the fact that all four Gospels record that Mary was the first witness of the resurrection of Jesus only makes the story more credible, more reliable, because no one would make that stuff up. If they were making it up, making up the resurrection account, they would have had Peter, the man, be the hero, not some woman. Nope. It is Mary in all four Gospels, faithful Mary, who is the hero of the story. Only when she arrived at the tomb in those early morning hours of that first Easter, she didn't know what she had found. She saw the stone rolled away, and she assumed that it was the work of grave robbers. She was so disconsolate that she ran weeping to find Peter and John, and she gave them the news. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And then comes the greatest foot race in the Bible through the empty streets of early morning Jerusalem. And here's how I imagine it took place. They started off together, but fat Peter who had eaten one too many Egg McBagels, he begins to huff and puff his way through the streets of Jerusalem while young, fit, vegan John <laughs> beats him to the tomb. But when John gets to the open door, he hesitates, he double clutches because he's afraid. And Peter, who is gasping and finally arrives, he sees his chance and he bolts past John so he can be the first one into the tomb. How very Peter-like. And they both saw the, the grave clothes that had just days before wrapped Jesus up in his, in his death. They, they, were all, they were all lying there, one of the set that had been around his head, off to one side. And it was puzzling. Why would grave robbers take the time to unwrap the body? Why not just pick the body wrapped up and make their way out of the tomb? It didn't make any sense at all. Peter saw this evidence, but it didn't register with him yet. But when John finally worked up his courage to follow Peter in, and he took a look, we are told that he believed. He believed that Jesus really had been raised from death to life, just as he promised he would be. And that is the tantalizing opening paragraph of John chapter 20, the resurrection chapter. All of chapter 20 is about resurrection accounts, and that's the way it opens. But this paragraph that I just read with you, read to you. It ends with a very surprising and frankly a, a bit unsettling verse to me. I've never noticed this verse before. It's been there all along and I've read it hundreds of times, but I never really noticed it until this time when it jumped out at me. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to their homes. And I think, how could that be? How could they do that? After what they had seen, they've they came, they found this huge stone rolled to the side. They go inside. There's no body in there, just the grave claws. It is empty. The tomb is empty. How, after they see that, could they just go back home? And you might say, well, what else would they do? Well, they could have hung around. Mary did. They could have hung around and see what was going to happen next. See who was going to show up next. They could have done that. Or if they really believed like it says John believed... They could have gone door to door at every house nearby, pounding on the door and crying out, you won't believe it, wake up. The most incredible thing ever happened. A dead man has been raised to life. Come, see the empty tomb of Jesus. We'll prove it to you. We'll show it to you. They could have done that. But nope. They just went back home. And we discover as we read on into John 20, not only did they go back home, when they got home, they padlocked the door because they were terrified. Because what they had seen with their eyes had not changed their hearts. What they had seen with their eyes had not changed their lives, not yet. This morning is my, in fact, this is my last service of my 37th Easter as senior pastor 
at Chapel Hill. Was anyone here 1988 in my first Easter sermon? Yep, mom was. <laughs> Way to go, mom. Way to hang in there with me. <laughs> yeah, 37. This is also my last Easter as senior pastor of Chapel Hill because I'm going to retire in September. But I'm going to tell you this. For every one of my 37 years, I have proclaimed the same central Christian truth on every Easter, and it is this. He is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive. That is the Easter story. That is the Christian story. If, if that's not true, if, if this is untrue, then, then it's nothing more than a make-believe story, like I read to my hideous granddaughter. There she is, Cece. Now, she's not too hideous. She's cute. It's nothing more than a make-believe story. If it's untrue, we might as well admit it. We might as well close the doors and sell the building to the food bank and admit that this has just been a pleasant delusion. But if it is true, if Jesus is alive, if, we, if what they saw with their eyes that morning was real, then it changes everything. Or at least it ought to change everything. And yet today, after this third service, when by this time thousands have gathered to hear this story told one more time, at the end of our services, like Peter and John, many of us will just go home. It was a nice story. It was a fun family moment. But we will go back to our ordinary lives as if everything was the same. Some may not be back until Christmas or maybe next Easter. Others come every week because it's the habit to come. But for too many of us, we hear this story and nothing is different. We sing the songs and then we go home unchanged. If that describes you, if you're one of those who has heard the res resurrection story over and over again perhaps, you've seen the evidence and yet you go home unchanged, I've got some good news for you. Jesus is not content to let you hide at home anymore. Jesus is not content to let you hide. He wants to have a life-changing relationship with you. And he is going to keep coming, coming, coming to you until he gets that. He's like the ever-ready bunny. He's not going to give up. Even when we want to go home, even when we want to hunker down and hide from Jesus, he just keeps coming after us. How do I know this is true? Because that's what the rest of chapter 20 teaches us. That's what the rest of John's resurrection story teaches us. That if we don't at first believe what we see, Jesus keeps coming at us until we do. In his grace, in his mercy, in his love, in his persistence, he just keeps coming after you. He will not give up on you. Let me prove it. Here's the first story. Jesus comes after the sorrowful. He comes after the sorrowful. After verse 10, which is what I ended my reading with, when Peter and John returned to their homes, Mary, bless her heart, hung around the tomb. But she was heartbroken. She was weeping for her loss. She still didn't think that Jesus was alive. She still thought his body had been stolen. She was an emotional wreck. But Jesus appears to her in that garden, in her sorrow, in his grace, and he speak, speaks so sweetly to her. Verse 15, Jesus says, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Mary still didn't recognize who it was. She thought it was the gardener and that maybe he'd taken the body and she could find out from him. And then Jesus spoke her name, Mary. <gasps> and she recognized it. She said, Rabboni, teacher. It is such a tender moment. And Jesus could have treated it differently. He could have said, woman, suck it up. Here's a hanky. I'm right here. But he doesn't do that. He meets her tenderly. He meets her in her grief, in her sorrow, and offers the comfort that only he could offer. If you are not presently in a season of grief in your own life, you are surrounded by those who are. Because this church, this morning, is dotted with people who are in a time of sadness, a time of grief. One of my friend's best buddies was killed last week in a car wreck, left behind a wife and three little kids. A long-term member of this church fell, cracked his head, 
and they are struggling to have him recover. And even this last week, I met with a man who sobbed with me about his addiction to pornography and the devastation that it has brought to his family. There is so much sadness in this world. And it would be easy for it to, to overtake us, to go home and to hunker down and to hide in our sorrow. And yet Jesus keeps coming, looking for you in your grief. He greets you with compassion. He calls out your name and offers you the comfort only he can offer. Why, you sad people, why would you hide from such a Savior? You need him. Jesus also comes to the fearful. He comes to the sorrowful. He comes also to the fearful. That's the next story. That night, we are told, as John continues in John chapter 20, the disciples gathered behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jews. So whatever Peter and John saw that morning, whatever evidence they might have ex experienced, whatever it meant for John to believe, it didn't translate into courage because they were still terrified. But Jesus comes to them anyhow. He meets them in their fear. He appears to them in their midst and he shows them his hands and his feet and his side and he says these wonderful words, peace be with you, shalom. He could have said, what is your problem, you losers? I told you time and time again I was going to rise from the dead. Peter and John, you too, I'm calling you out. You saw the evidence this morning in the empty tomb. So why are you quivering here behind a locked door? I am so disappointed in you. He might have said that, but he doesn't say that. He comes to them right in the midst of their fear and offers them peace. Anyone afraid here right now? Anyone struggling with fear right now? I remember a season in my life when I was so afraid. I was being accused of things. I was being threatened. And there were moments when I felt like I could hardly breathe. I had no appetite. I couldn't sleep. Any of you ever been there? My prayers seemed to bounce off of the ceiling. I wanted just to stay home and hunker down. I wanted to hide. And then add to that the sense of guilt I had because I knew I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, and I ought to be trusting God to take care of me, but I didn't. I wasn't. But I'm so grateful for that moment that when in my fear Jesus came to me by His Spirit, I still remember the moment of my deliverance, the relief that I got from that, the moment of fear-conquering peace. I will never forget it. Do you need that? Why? You fearful people, why would you hide from such a Savior? You need Him. Jesus comes to the sorrowful. He comes to the fearful. And, and finally, He comes to the skeptical. Because one of the disciples wasn't there that night, right? In addition to Judas. What was his name? Thomas. You know his name, Thomas. Thomas wasn't there that Easter night when Jesus appeared to the rest of the disciples. And when they later reported to him what they had experienced, he didn't believe it. Verse 25, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side where the spear had been thrusted in, he said, I will never believe. This was the pain of a man who had retreated into skepticism. and We call him now Doubting Thomas, don't we? Of course, the truth is every one of them was doubting. Could have been doubting Peter, doubting James, doubting John, doubting... But poor Thomas, he gets saddled with the dame. Doubting Thomas. But he was not going to be tricked again. He demanded proof. And Jesus could have said, how dare you? How dare you? Who are you to make demands of me? I am the Lord. I am the risen Christ. Instead, a week later... Jesus appears again, and this time Thomas is there, and he invites Thomas to put his fingers in his wounds. He says, I don't want you to doubt. I want you to believe. Whatever it takes for you to believe, go ahead, probe away. But Thomas fell to his knees, and he offered the greatest declaration of faith that we find in the New Testament, my Lord and my God. Jesus, in his grace, came to a skeptical Thomas with patience and with humility. 
I know there are skeptics here this morning. You, you might be here out of courtesy for your family, and I would say, good for you, way to, way to put family first. But the truth is, you don't really buy it. It seems like a fairy tale to you. You're a person of science. You're a person of, of logic. And none of this rings true. Well, here's the incredible news for you skeptics out there. Jesus isn't offended by you at all. He is not put off by your doubt or your suspicion. He's not frustrated or angry that you're not quick to believe. In fact, he understands that keen mind of yours because he made it. He made you exactly the way you are. And yet in his humility, Jesus comes to you, you skeptic, and he says, probe away. Probe away. Ask any questions you want. What would it take for you to really believe in me? I don't want you to doubt anymore. I want you to believe. So let me convince you. What will it take? Why, you skeptical people, why would you hide from such a Savior? You need Him. In the end, all of them believed. Impetuous Peter and cautious John and Anxious Mary and the trepidatious disciples and suspicious Thomas, they all believed because Jesus just kept coming. He would not let loose of them. And that same Jesus, beloved, is coming for you this morning. Whether you believe him in this moment or whether you return home like the disciples and try to ignore him, try to tamp down what's stirring in your heart, Jesus will not let up. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now, urging you, despite your sorrow or your fear or your skepticism, dis urging you to believe in Him and to live as if you believe in Him. So fair warning, you're not going to be able to go home and hide. One poet called Jesus the hound of heaven. The hound of heaven. He is on your tra trail and He won't give up until you see with the eyes of faith. Next March, I'm going to be leading my 11th pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And they've been great trips, and I've learned so much and grown so much in my faith. But by far, my most memorable trip was 17 years ago when my boy Cooper was 12 years old, and he came along with me. And on our last day, remember this, Coop? On our last day, uh, we got up early which is something for a 12-year-old, but we did. We got up, we took a sunrise walk to the Western Wall, what we call the Wailing Wall, and we prayed there together. And then we were getting ready to return back to the hotel, and Coop said, Dad, can we go see the empty tomb one more time? And it was getting late, and the bus was leaving, and we had a flight to catch, and I said, we can do it, but we'll have to run. And Cooper said, let's do it. And so we ran, man, did we run. Like Peter and John, my son and I ran through the empty streets of early morning Easter Jerusalem. Shops that were normally packed out had nobody there. The sounds of our feet slapping against the cobblestones were echoing against the walls on either side of us as we ran and we ran. And we made it. We saw the empty tomb of Jesus. We went inside the empty tomb of Jesus. And once more, we were reminded of that moment that changed eternity. He is not here. He is risen. I will never forget that morning running with my boy through Jerusalem. There's nothing a Christian father wants more to hear from his son than, Dad, can we go see the empty tomb of Jesus? And our Heavenly Father wants to hear the same thing from you this day. You've heard the story. You've sung the music. You've read the Bible. The question is, can you go home this morning as if nothing happened? What if instead... You said, Father, would you take me to the empty tomb in a new way? Would you let me see with eyes of faith? Would you let me believe as I've never believed before? And would you let me be changed by what I believe? For 37 years, I have proclaimed the same thing every Easter morning. He is risen. And this morning, I declare to you one last time, He is risen still. He is still risen, hasn't changed. So what will you do with that news? Will you just go home unchanged? 
What does Jesus need to say to you in this moment to help you realize and believe the power, the forgiveness, the mercy, the grace that the empty tomb can offer you this day? You know what I call those doors back there? Some of you do. The doors of amnesia. The doors of amnesia. Somehow, no matter what brilliant words are spoken up here on a Sunday morning, the minute you walk through those doors of amnesia, your mind is wiped clean. It's all forgotten, and off you go. But not today. I don't want you to be like Peter and John. I don't want you to walk out of those doors of amnesia and forget what you have seen and forget what you have heard and forget what has been stirred in your heart by the Holy Spirit. I entreat you, believe it, receive it, proclaim it, and be changed by it. I invite you to pray with me right now. Even if you're not a prayer, would you bow your heads? Even if you're not a prayer, would you close your eyes as a courtesy? Because I want to give those people who tend to go home unchanged, I want to give you a chance to be changed right now. The way that happens is we say, Jesus, I do believe. Like Thomas, we say, my Lord and my God, I've never seen it before. I've never surrendered to you before, but this day I'm going to do it. I want to be changed by you. I want to experience the power of your resurrection and your forgiveness in my life. And if that's you, if you want this to be the day that you go home changed, then I invite you to pray this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for coming to this earth to save me. Thank you for dying for my sins. And thank you for rising victorious from the dead. I believe you. I re believe in you and your power. I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. Will you help me to lead the life you created me to live despite my sorrow, despite my fear, despite my skepticism. Jesus, will you overcome all of that? Enter my heart and change me forever. I ask this in Jesus' name. Now, keep your heads bowed. I just want to know if anyone prayed that prayer. So if you did, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'd love to see you. Just put your hand up. No one's looking around but me. I'd like to pray for you. So if you prayed that prayer saying, I surrender to Jesus, I believe, would you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. I see you in the back. Anyone else saying, I prayed that prayer for the first time? Jesus, you see these people, you know their hearts. And I pray that you would take them to a new place of faith and life because they've said yes to you this day. In Jesus' name.
Hey, we want to leave this place celebrating, knowing that we have been raised to new life in Jesus. Let's sing it out. I was buried beneath my shade. Who could bury that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I made it. I was possibly just go home unchanged if that's true do something about it come back next week we're going to start the book of Acts find out what the Holy Spirit does when people say okay here we are we're ready we're ready to go or maybe come to Alpha if you have questions it'd be a perfect place maybe go home and pick up your Bible and read the book of John for yourself and learn who this remarkable Jesus 
is, but don't just go home. Go home different. Go home changed. Following the service, there will be some pastors back at the wood wall. They would love to meet you, especially if you were one of those who raised their hand to, to give your life to Christ. They have a gift for you, including a Bible. So please come back and let them meet you. If you need any prayer, you can make your way right around the corner. There would be folks in that prayer chapel that would love to pray with you. We're going to close this Easter Sunday off in the same way we close every Resurrection Sunday off, which is what every Sunday is, with a, a refill of the Holy Spirit. So raise your hands and receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His perfect peace, both now and forevermore. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.